How can you create a persuasive presentation? And what are some ethical considerations when doing so? That's just some of what we'll be talking about in today's episode of Talking Talks. Hello and welcome to Talking Talks, a behind the scenes look at how great presenters make great presentations. I'm your host, Bree Williams, and today we are joined by Troy Andrews. Troy has been based in Shanghai since 2008, running his world class presentation skills business, PresentationPersuasion.com. Troy has trained thousands of people in his methodology, most of them from Fortune 500 companies. I first met Troy when we shared a virtual stage at NudgeStock 2020, and I was excited to learn that he specializes in the application of behavioral science to how we communicate. This should be a great conversation. So let's hear what Troy has to share. Troy Andrews, a very warm welcome. Uh, uh, Hello to Shanghai from Melbourne. I would love to start, I I would love to start Troy with a question, of course, about what on earth is a persuasive presentation and how does it differ from one that isn't? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And if you search for persuasive presentations, you will get a whole hodgepodge of different um, types of presentations that I wouldn't consider very persuasive. So I think the, the biggest thing for me is that someone is clear on what their outcome is, what their goal is, which sounds simple, but uh, this every time I deal with my clients and the first time I ask them, what do you want out of this? It's rarely what we wind up having as an outcome. So uh, sometimes people just don't think of this simple thing uh, deeply enough. So that's the start of a persuasive presentation, actually having a a clear outcome. And some of those things, like sometimes someone will be like, uh, yeah, I want to sell this or something like that. But then we'll, we'll talk in, in, more detail i'll ask some more probing questions and you'll find out that usually the sales process is very long for what they do with and so for this presentation it's really not maybe to sell it's really to build up trust or build up rapport and once you have that as your goal instead of selling it's a totally different tone it's a a, the way you talk the things you talk about the, the 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 language you use is different so that's 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 probably the biggest thing but what you see a lot of on, on the internet, if you search for that, is a logically sequencing material. And that, that, is, that is good for logic and that's good for having a nice flow, but it doesn't make it automatically persuasive. Uh, and uh, I think, you, you, as you know, we've talked about before, I'm very into storytelling. So persuasion involves a lot of emotion and, you know, I think the things that we're very interested in is behavioral science and behavioral economics. And we know the the judgment making process and decision making process is not always rational and we have to appeal to some kind of emotion. So what, what I see a lot of uh, in people talking about persuasive presentations, it's just logical sequence. And um, what I try to deal with is having a a clear outcome and a, a clear strategy to get there. That's so interesting. So when you say um, a logical sequence, so people are making the mistake of thinking that if we give people what enough information or argument, they're going to arrive at the point. Is is that what you mean? Yeah, that's what most people think. And and uh, I always show kind of like you know Aristotle thousands of years ago came up with the uh, art of rhetoric, and they have that he has that pie chart, and it's kind of like. 65% pathos, uh, 25% e- uh, logos, and then 10% uh, uh, ethos. And when you go through that, it's like people people want to focus on that 25%, like more charts, more data, more logic, more um, you know facts and, and points. But you need that. You need credibility. You need evidence. But that's just a, a small part of it. So usually people spend too much part of that, where that pathos is, is emotion. And it doesn't mean that the speaker is emotional and emphatic and dramatic. It could be, 
but really it's about stirring up something in the audience that triggers some kind of emotion. So that's why storytelling is so good because uh, people relate to it very easily and, the, and they the absorb the message without you implicitly saying it. And I think that's, that's um, a very powerful way to persuade. This is intriguing, and I think the um, the storytelling elements will probably thread its way through our whole conversation. But I'm very fascinated by why you think people do always veer towards the logic. Do you think it's a sense of security? Is it um, how we think we have to operate, particularly in business? What do you think is the underlying motivation as, as to why people tend to veer in the direction of logic? Yeah, my guess would be that most of uh, a lot of the appeals that I try to use are kind of like nudge type things. And one of the things I love about nudge theory to me is that it's kind of invisible sometimes or most of the times people don't see it. It's not the thing. It's right in front of your face, but you don't see it. Um, whereas facts and figures we, we see and we, we register that in, in a very logical way. So we this is what we what just comes up in in our minds, but we miss the, the, the invisible thing that's going on in the background. That's why I like advertising. You'll hear some facts and figures, but when you actually get into the psychology of what it's doing, there's a lot behind there that people don't see. So when people try to make their appeal, they don't know about the invisible stuff. So they just give you the obvious points. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, we could talk at length about that behavioral science, but I'll, I'll hold back for now. But um, what I am also interested in, when I was looking at your website, which is uh, persuasivepresentation.com, I was taken with what you have on there, which um, says, lose your fear, find your power, persuade. Now, tell me a little bit about why fear and why power. Uh, yeah, the reason I chose that is because a lot of the clients that I work with, they want to persuade, but really before they can even do that, they need to get confidence. And most people don't have that uh, true confidence. They might put on a fake confidence, which is, is kind of worthless in a lot of ways, but um, people see through that or they, they feel like it's, it's coming across as proud or arrogant uh, instead of genuine and authentic. So I think one of the things that is underlying um, problem with a lot of people is that they, they lack that confidence. So I, I kind of want to hit both angles of, you know, I'm, I'm not this, if someone's very proud and very confident, they might not go to my website. So I'm looking for the people who want to obtain that. Um, and I think that rings true to a lot of people where they, they want to be, persuasive but then they're like how can I be persuasive when I'm not confident you know so we first um really met each other through nudge Talk 2020 and I thought what a great um foil for our conversation today so I thought we would start with how you kicked off your nudge Talk presentation so let's have a cheeky look at how you kick us off and we'll come back and have a chat about it we all know how behavioral economics and behavioral science is used for governments, for banks, for healthcare, and even advertising. But how does the average business professional use it in their daily communication? So we're talking about presentations mainly, but also conversations, negotiations, even written communication. Well, today I'm going to share with you a tool that I developed for my clients. It will help you to clarify your goals, uh, develop a strategy, and then design a persuasive presentation by applying behavioral economics and behavioral science. So, Troy, talk us through why you chose to introduce your topic in that way. Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that w when I started um, PresentationPersuasion.com, uh, I had been doing presentation training for a long time, and it's kind of a, people put it in a category of public speaking in their minds a lot of times. But I really try to focus on the presentation design and, and the content, not just the, the, the voice control and the, the gesturing and things like that. So it's part of it, but it's a small part. So I really wanted to focus on um, more the, the persuasion theory angle of it. So when, when I had this chance with Nudgestock, I really wanted to get into the, the psychology behind all that. And um, when Sam Tatum, when he introduced me, 
um, I actually, he actually said, how would you like to be introduced? And I kind of told him, you know, and it, it kind of set me up for that. And he, he, I believe he, um, he added some of his own things, but he was talking about, um, the story of the cobbler shoes and, you know, does the cobbler have bad shoes? That's a bad reflection on him. So sometimes in behavioral science, I was trying to think of the audience, a lot of these scientists and, you know, and psychologists and sociologists, they do all this deep study and have all these interesting things. And then sometimes they come across as very bland and uninteresting and they don't know how to tell their, uh, their talk about their topic in a, a storyline type way. So I was trying to appeal to that, thinking of the people who would be watching this would not be my average audience of, of like some of the Fortune 500 companies I work with. Um, these are people who are just spend their lives in books and academia, and I'm, but maybe not conveying that to people or to audiences. So I was uh, trying to put those two together. Yeah, and you certainly, um, you sort of alluded to some assumed knowledge there. So you were talking to the audience that, you know, we all know about behavioral science. And so we're in fellowship here and we're going to kick off, which I thought was interesting because that's not always appropriate either when you're you're talking mm. to an audience. Yeah. So I think because Nudge Doc is a festival of behavioral science, absolutely appropriate to sort of um, to lend, lend on that. Yeah. And then you um, also. I struggled with that. You did? Yeah, because uh, I, I had been watching Nudge Stock every year, but it was a small event, just kind of top, you know, the top people in the industry. It was expensive to get to. It was hard to get tickets. It was, it was just something I would never dream that I would be a part of. And then when it opened, now the audience from before is not the same audience as now. So I was wondering how much will they know? How much do I have to explain? How much can I assume? And yeah, it was it was a little challenging. Yeah, certainly. Um, so just to give people context, Nudge Stock used to just be in a part of England, so it was a live event um, from the stage, so a conference. And with the pandemic, they created a virtual festival. It was over twelve hours. It was <laughs> it was a long time, but yeah, a whole That's series right. of virtual presentations. Um, and and going further into your presentation, I'm interested because um, one of your key principles that you talk about is um, C for change in your presentation, which um, I'll, I'll uh, provide a link to in the show notes and everything. But you talk about perception. So let's let's hear you talking about the role of perception. And I've got a question around that. So think of some different things that you want to be perceived as. And then as you build your presentation, you can keep those words in mind to make sure that you reach that goal. So my question really for you, Troy, how were you hoping to be perceived? So you had particular background, you had you were standing, you must have decided what to wear. So what went into your thought process about how people would perceive you? You you would ask that question, Brie. That's, that's a good <laughs> question. Um, yeah, I struggled with that too because actually this was in the midst of the pandemic when everyone was locked in. But in China, we went through a, a very brief lockdown that was very strong, very strong. But after that, we were kind of free. So by the time Nudge Stock came around, I was already, I could walk around, I could go to a, a venue somewhere and, and, you know, have a nice set to, to uh, present from. But I figured everyone else wasn't, so that would have been kind of weird. So I went to do it in my house. My apartment is very small and, and modest. I was trying to think of a nice backdrop. Uh, I was trying to think of um, something interesting because with, with persuasion, one of the things is if something is unique, it stands out and it, it's, it stands out in the memory. And, you know, what do you want to be remembered for? Sometimes just that one little thing. Oh, the guy with the guitar is in the back. It's, it's something. So that was one thing. It's kind of, kind of interesting uh, backdrop. Also, you know, I was trying to think like I, I didn't, I wasn't connected to a lot of these people. I was trying to think uh, like Rory Sutherland is very into classic rock and roll. And, you know, I thought maybe that would, he would appeal to him. You know, I was just trying to think of different things that it would appeal to. So when you are more familiar with an audience, um, is there an example that would inform 
your um, decision around how you present yourself, for instance? Yeah. So uh, first of all, for me, I'm, I, I don't claim to be a presenter myself. I, I do um, because I, I have to for work, but uh, I'm more of a coach. So I, for me, I'm usually coaching my clients into really doing a deep dive into who their audience is. So that's what I, I really focus on because for me, um, my audience is my clients most of the time. So, uh, and I do, I do look them up, but that's, that's a big part of that, that kind of ABC idea of just going through really a deep dive into the audience. Um, I was telling you earlier, um, off camera that, uh, I just got this, uh, big account. Uh, and when I was going to get this account, I looked up the guy that I was, who was interviewing me for this. And I just looked on there. I saw on his, he had a blog and it was talking about how he loved craft beer and how he loved um, poetry. And I don't know anything about poetry, but I know a lot about um, craft beer. <laughs> so I called my friend in Tokyo. I found out, I was like, hey, remember those breweries we went to? What were the names? What were the beers? Um, and then when I talked to him, I was just like, hey, how's the lockdown going? You know, in Japan. And he's just like, oh yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's rough here. We can't get out. We have to stay in. And I was like, yeah, we had that here in, too in Shanghai, but, um, you know, eventually we were out and I just thought how great it was to just go out and get a pint again. And before that, his face was very serious and very professional and very, okay, you know, we're waiting for the other guest and we'll join you soon. And after that, his face just dropped and he's like, oh, mate, he's a British guy. And he's just like, I would love to have a pint. And then I was just like, yeah, when I went to Tokyo and instantly we had a connection. And we were able to, it just kind of everything went smoother from there. And what I like about it is after we kind of signed the contract and everything, I told him about that. And he was like, oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. And that's the, the interesting part about it. People don't really think it's creepy or manipulative. It's just showing interest in the person. Just like if you would go to a job interview, um, there's nothing worse than not knowing anything about the company. What, well, what company is this? Uh, yeah, I'd love to work here. Um, People hate that. So it's the same thing with people. If you take an interest in them, find out what they like, talk about those topics. Uh, it's, it's a very normal thing, but some people have trouble with it. They feel it's a little um, manipulative, but it's it's really not. It's just taking the interest. Yeah. Well, that that's good because I was absolutely going to ask you about that. Before that, I just thought I'd share with the audience. So your ABC model, A is for audience, B is for bridges and barriers, and C is for change, just in case people weren't sure what the... Um, the ABC stands for. Um, now, yes, back to, back to the question of that, because there was in your presentation the story of a CEO needing to present to a board and you talk about doing a deep dive. So let's have a look at that because I am interested about the ethics of this decision. So let's have a look. Well, we did a deep dive into these board of directors' personal lives. Uh, first, we looked professionally. We looked at their history. Uh, their business philosophy, their successes and their failures. Uh, we looked at their personal life. We looked at their personality type. We looked at their family, their friends, uh, the feelings that they had on different matters. We knew who was an avid tennis player. We knew who had a green thumb and we knew who liked long, quiet walks on the beach. So when I was listening to that, I was like, well, that is a deep dive. I don't. I wonder how I would feel about that if I was one of those um, board members. So share with us your thoughts about the ethics of what we do when we're trying to craft a, per, a persuasive message or a persuasive presentation to land with specific uh, people or audiences. Yeah, so... To me, this is, is just a background check. You're, you're just looking at uh, information that is widely available that uh, many times the people have put out there themselves. Uh, um, one, one client I was working with, she was talking to, uh, she had to give a presentation to a CEO in America and the person loved football. And with that, we put in some football idioms and things like that. Uh, but where we got that knowledge was from his own autobiography about his life. So it, it's um, it's not like we're going through people's trash or or uh, or you know Cambridge Analytics kind of stuff. It, this is just information that's widely out there, um, and the, yeah, the ethics part is something I've often talked about on you know I put a lot of posts on LinkedIn, and the ethics is is a, is always a big issue because 
where does persuasion dip into manipulation is is always an interesting topic to me because we've we've seen the the dark side of that so much where where people just really get into privacy issues and where they share information and all these things um yeah so i'm i'm very concerned about the ethics of it but for for something like that for a board of directors just looking at their history it's it's to me again it's just showing interest and i've i've asked a lot of the clients that i've worked with about this topic and how they feel about it and pretty much unanimously when they find out that someone took the time to do the research and find out things they they view it as a, a sign of respect so but i do understand that some people feel it's like oh it seems kind of weird looking up people but well um, i think it's it's almost a litmus test isn't it if you can feel comfortable talking to your client after the fact and sharing for instance that you knew he liked beer or you, you talk to people if you're comfortable yeah. to share that with them I think that pretty much is a guide to say you're comfortable morally and ethically with what you're doing because um, you're willing to have the conversation and be open about it. I think as soon as you then um, get a bit nervous about it, then maybe um, you yeah step over over the mark. It's your conscious talking at that point, yeah. yeah. But it is an interesting one. So, yes, I, I think strongly the due diligence, so doing the research on the audience whether it's a, a large audience, a small or an individual, I think is really sensible. Because as you say, you wouldn't turn up to a job interview and not know who the company was or all those people. So I think that's um, certainly sensible. And I think also that people ultimately want to feel they're being seen and being heard. And if you can sort of mirror or play back things that are important to them, I think that's a really nice way of doing it even with primes like guitars behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it, uh, it, it follows some of the principles of persuasion from Cialdini. So uh, consistency and commitment. When, when you see what other, like in that one instance with the CEO, he was using some of the things that they have done or that they have said. And when you say that, just like, yeah, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking from your playbook or I'm, I'm learning from your example. Well, remember you said that, I think that's so true. And that's why I'm doing this. It's very hard for them to, to pick a fight with that or to go against it. And they're more likely to defend it, honestly, because then they're like, yeah, well, you know, it's like, yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. And it worked. And well, well, that's right. Good. And it, it in, increases the likability factor as well. Um, because they can't help but like themselves. <laughs> so, um, now, there's also something that you talk about around authority, and we've already t um, touched on that, but let's have a, a look at you talking about the role of authority. Well, we could just tell them. We could list off uh, my background, my accomplishments, my experience, uh, things like that. Uh, but that is kind of bragging. It might be considered bull to them, and it's kind of boring. So talk to us there about what you think presenters should not do. You know, I haven't watched that in a year. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, what shouldn't they do? Yeah, so the, 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 again, I think we were talking about this off camera before the interview, but the, the normal thing that people do is just come with a lot of facts and a lot of data. And with that, we, we, we sense that instantly when someone's doing that. And, and it, it's a, it's a, it turns us off to, to their message. So um, with that, we talked about Aristotle had those, those three components. One of them is credibility. So we need that ethos. We need that um, where people say, oh, I, you're someone I should listen to. You seem like an expert. We need that. But if I just say, I'm an expert, it's, it sounds like, no, you're not. <laughs> so if you can find ways to uh, tell it in a in a very subtle way. Have them sense that without directly saying it. So, again, getting back to storytelling, uh, my name is Troy. I like to think of the the Trojan horse kind of uh, metaphor of you know they're receiving the horse, but inside we have our secret message. Um, in this case, we're not trying to kill anyone, but we we do have a, a goal, right? So we're trying to to move something ahead. They receive the horse and they say, "Oh, thank you. That was a that was a great story." But Inside, we're, we're kind of developing like, hey, I'm a credible person. You know, I work with very high level clients. I have a good success rate. 
things that if you said directly would would sound um yeah it would sound like you're bragging yeah and but, and as part of that you from memory had sam who was introducing you credential you didn't you so you um that, that was the arc wasn't it that you had him do some of the heavy lifting so that by the time you came to stage you already were set is that right yeah right and again that's uh, and i told everyone that that's what i did i told them i said tell them i'm an expert in you know persuasion and that gives you credibility someone else can give you credibility but if you take it it's not very good so um, I think this is also from Cialdini. He also talks about this, where if, if you introduce someone, you can really make massive changes in the way they're perceived. Because instead of saying, hi, this is Troy Andrews, he's going to talk about this. They're like, Troy Andrews, he's, he's done this, he's done that, he's done that. It gives you this instant status that even if we were working together and everyone knew that we're on the same team and we both benefit, you would still perceive it as true or more likely to be true than if I was to say it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's kind of why I did that. But just, I was trying to demonstrate of, of like, did you notice how he did that? Did you notice how you felt? That's, that's the power of a simple introduction. So it wasn't really to give myself credit. It was more to display what it looks like and how it feels. Yes. And being very humble, I, 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 I like that. So, no, I think it is. And the message, I think, for people uh, watching this is that whilst you might be thinking of your presentation and what you're doing once, you know, the microphone metaphorically or literally is handed to you, don't forget everything that leads up to that moment. And if the words are coming out of someone else's mouth, Make sure they're the great words and make sure that they nail the intro and, and write it for them rather than them wing it. And usually these people, they're, whether they're MCs or, you know, a special spokesperson, they've got a lot on their mind and they would really do with the help. So I think um, you, it was a clever, a clever move on your part for sure. Now, just as, as we, because um, time is evaporating very quickly, storytelling in your mind what is it and why am i hearing about it everywhere yeah it, it, it definitely seems like it, it's uh blown up recently uh especially in our circles i think yeah so st what is storytelling so this is a point of contention for a lot of people so i can only define it the way that i define it so storytelling a story in basic the most basic form is a telling of events or a retelling of events um, but that can also be just very boring. So we have the, the classic traditional literary story line. So you have many different models of that. Everyone knows the hero's journey, things like that. Uh, those are good, but they're, they're usually made more for Hollywood or novels or things like that, or TV shows. And, you know, they all follow it. You can look at so many examples of following the hero's journey, uh, for instance. But storytelling to me is really about humanizing information so when you think about um you know the book made to stick it talks about a what is a sticky message and uh, i love the way they they kind of just m simplify that they say it should be something people can relate to that they can remember and thus they can retell and storytelling ticks all those boxes uh we can relate to it and it, it when we put in uh kind of universal feelings or emotions that people can relate to they don't have to experience the same thing that we've experienced or that our character has experienced but they will relate to the emotion of it uh, whether it's loss or regret or you know some gaining something or um, pride in something so when we can kind of line up our message with a story that ha hits one of these universal uh, themes people will relate to it and they'll resonate to it. And that's really the power of storytelling. And yeah, I think uh, Jennifer Aikner from uh, Stanford, she did a test where she found out that storytelling is like 22 times more memorable than just facts alone, which is, a, that's a giant difference, right? So, um, and in my storytelling workshops, I start off with telling a brief story about me and then I tell some facts about storytelling and then 
on day two, I'll say, okay, so yesterday I told a story in the beginning and some facts. And then, then they can actually, again, I, I can demonstrate it to them and they can actually go, oh yeah, it's true. Yeah, I don't remember all the facts, but the story, everyone in the room can tell exactly point for point what the story was. So um, there's, a, there's a great book called Impossible to Ignore by um, Carmen Simon. She's a neuroscientist. And she, in there, she outlines all these things that get our attention. And she's very big on memory. And attention is such, it's the most valuable resource we have these days. And every company is vying for it to try to get it and paying a lot of attention and research and money to, to get it. So when we can tell something that, that gets attention, like a story, um, it's a very, very valuable thing. And a lot of times with when I'll, I'll have my clients insert a little story in there, they'll say that the, the key decision maker was writing something or on their phone or something. The second they start into a story, they'll put the phone down and look up. Um, this is something they've never heard before. So just on that novelty of, of you know, this is new and curiosity, they'll, they'll start paying attention. So if you can really insert some major point in that story, um, you have a better chance of reaching attention and thus memory. It's a great, a great answer because I think just as, as in, in closing, I think the um, through line from my perspective in our conversation has been, I don't know if I'm overstating it, but the humanity of presenting and to be persuasive ultimately, yes, focus on the outcome, but you need to understand yourself as a presenter and bring more of yourself to stage through storytelling and being vulnerable about it but also know so much more about your audience. So, Troy, unfortunately, that is all we have time for in this episode of Talking Talks. If people want to find more about Troy, and why wouldn't you, and this fabulous website that I've been uh, talking about, you can find Troy at presentationpersuasion.com. As always, you can find me at briewilliams.com. But Troy, I want to sincerely thank you for your time and for everything you've shared with us today. Thanks, and I look forward to sharing more in a future episode of Talking Talks.